examples. Um, you can find the uh, links to these slides, again, if you, anybody wants to follow along. Uh, WPBuffs.com forward slash who. Uh, and I also scheduled them to tweet out. So, and blackout slides, also good. All right. Uh, tweeted them to uh, go out as well, so you can find the slides there. So the first thing I want to look at is uh, just this little landing page, WPMRR.com. Uh, this video course is like Neo jacking into the matrix and learning Kung Fu instantly. Um, it's interesting that the lights went down because I was going to do a little hand demonstration. Who knows what this is referencing? Who knows the movie that this is referencing? So and keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. I want to see them high. So I see a lot of people, someone already said Matrix, right? So a lot of people here know what that movie is. Keep your hands raised. Keep them raised. Keep your hand raised only if this is, like, you would consider this one of your favorite movies. OK? So a few hands went down. I see some people still. This is one of your favorite movies. But some people's hands went down. Uh, and kind of a simple demonstration. But you can put your hands down now. Sorry. Um, a simple demonstration, just wanting to kind of go over the fact that you know, this landing page is trying to connect with people pretty immediately via this um, kind of matrix reference. It says, take the red pill. Everyone whose favorite movie knows what that is, knows exactly what that means. Um, but not everyone's hands went up when we talked about this being someone's favorite movie. So this landing page is not trying to connect with everybody out there on the internet. It's kind of trying to connect with people who are kind of interested uh, in this, uh, not just this movie but particularly, but um, the kind of, I guess, nerddom that comes with you know, being a fan of the Matrix. Uh, and I think this is really important because uh, this is kind of what I want to talk about today, is that we want to know the kind of people who are visiting our website because this could either be very good for this website because they're targeting the right kind of person, or it might be very bad because they're not targeting the right people at all. And that kind of leads us into the talk I want to give today. I want, to, I want us to figure out how we can get to know who's visiting our website. Um, there are going to be a lot of talks today about SEO and driving traffic to your website and, and growing a site or a business uh, via WordPress. But and I'm kind of glad this talk I got to go first because I think this is a really important foundation before you do any of that. Because it doesn't matter how much traffic you get to your website if you're not engaging people in the right way. Uh, and that starts with just getting to know who those people are. Who are those people who are visiting your website? You know, those 100,000 people who visited your site, 100,000 people visited your site last month. If you don't know who they are, how are you going to uh, cater to them? Um, before we kind of get started with that, I want us to keep this question in mind through this talk. Um, are these the kind of visitors you want? Because you have the ability to change that. I just want to make sure that that's clear throughout the talk. Um, we're going to be talking about like ways to see exactly the kind of people who are visiting your website in order to draw conclusions and, again, cater to them a little bit better. But there's this overarching question of, are these even the visitors do you want, that you want? Are these the right people who are going to buy your products or services, uh, are going to read your content, who are going to engage with you? I want us to keep that question in mind, because that's, that's the first question we should really be asking, and we will continue to ask. Now, easy wins. So we're just going to start with the kind of easiest ways to see who's visiting the website. Um, Google Analytics. Raise your hand if you have Google Analytics installed on the site. Most people. Uh, if you don't, great idea. Uh, free analytics tool uh, that allows you to get a lot of the data that we're going to talk about now. Uh, so left side of your screen, uh, under audience, demographics, overview, you can see a pretty good uh, idea of the kind of people who are coming to your website. Again, pretty baseline information. Um, a caveat that this is something you have to activate in Google Analytics. It doesn't come if you just activate a Google Analytics account. You actually have to go into this area and click, I want it. Uh, I want this data to flow into my account. Um, this is for WPBuffs.com. This is for our website. Um, the point I want to uh, make clear here is just that you can see the majority of people coming to our website, 25 to 34 years old, and about 75%, almost 75% male. So 
when you have this kind of information, it does kind of change the aspect of what you want to do on your site. And I'm not saying that you don't want to cater to, you know, I don't want, I, I'm not trying to create my website so it only caters to males who are only in this age range, but it, on, it also gives me some information so that I can, you know, try to make those kind of visitors uh, a little happier and target them a little more. Uh, so, on our website, this is a blog post we just published yesterday. Um, you know, the 25 to 35 age range, we would consider like millennial. We all like our GIFs and our emojis and all that, but I, I think that, and, and so with each of our uh, posts, right under the kind of second, uh, second, first or second paragraph, we just add a little GIF here. Um, and my goal here is not to make people fall in love with our brand or, you know, that kind of comes later. Um, the goal really is to get people to continue reading. And so this kind of small connection, uh, you know, a little joke here and there, I think gets people a little more comfortable with that uh, and gets them to keep reading. So that, you know, demographic information we just saw leads to, you know, things we can do on site to do a little better of a job targeting that audience. Back to Google Analytics. Uh, under the audience, interests overview uh, section, you can actually see some additional information about the kind of people who are, are visiting your website in terms of the kind of websites they like to browse, the kind of, uh, the, the, uh, some additional uh, kind of clarifying information about what that kind of person is interested in. Uh, and again, this is on WP Buffs uh, on our website. The two I wanted to point out were the technology slash technophiles. Uh, and lifestyle uh, and hobbyist slash shutterbugs. Um, and if we come down here to see kind of what we do, again, on our blog, um, because we have that information, people who are shutterbugs who uh, come to the site, who are interested in photography, we have a lot of great photography on the site. It's kind of the featured image for all these, uh, all of our uh, posts. Uh, and because we have technophiles on the site, we also write the kind of content that talks about the kind of SaaS tools our business uses. Um, and that gets a lot of traffic because a lot of people are interested in that. Uh, and a lot of people, you know, they find that from other blog posts on the site and they see that and are interested. So the way that we want to kind of cater to the people, who, the kind of people who are visiting the website is to create content for them, right? We're not building content we assume people are gonna like. We actually are creating content that we have data that says people are going to be interested in this. So we're not kind of writing content uh, hoping people are going to enjoy it. We kind of have an idea that we know that they will. If I don't put water break slides in, I just whew, zoom right through. So feel free to water break slide with me if you'd like. <laughs> it's a great movie also. <clears throat> All right, back into Google Analytics. Uh, again, talking about these easy wins. So you can see what languages people are, are speaking. What, uh, and this is, data is being taken from the language set in people's browsers. Uh, so for our website, most people come uh, speaking English. Not a surprise, our blog's in English. It's not in any other languages. Uh, and the point uh, I want to point out, or the piece I want to point out over here on this right side is just the, we have a goal set up to see what percentage of people are subscribing to our email. And so you can see, you know, 1.42%, 1.35%. So yeah, you know, about one, and a, a little under one and a half percent of people convert to email, who are to our email list, who are English speakers. But the third language, DE, which actually I had to look up last night when I was finishing the slides, which is German. That's uh, uh, German speakers are our third biggest uh, visitors, and they subscribe at far lower at a percentage. So this could be an opportunity for us to, maybe we want to add some translate options to our website to cater to that crowd. I don't have an example slide of this because we don't do that. But it still is good to have this data and it may be an interesting opportunity for us. Uh, Google Analytics, also you can see where people are coming from, how people are getting to your site, which is a big indicator of what their intent is. Uh, and so, our biggest driver for traffic is organic search, obviously. Uh, that means people searching Google for WordPress content come 
to our website uh, and find those blog posts uh, and internal pages as well. Uh, but like I mentioned before, we have kind of our conversion rate here. You know, less than 1% of organic searchers uh, or people at least who come directly from Google uh, subscribe to our email list, which is not great, right? Under 1%, not ideal. Um, and s you can see, like, for instance, direct traffic's right below. It gets far less visitors. But they're much better visitors for subscribing to our email, as are <laughs> literally all of our traffic sources, right? Uh, you know, paid search, almost 4%. Email, almost 6%. Social, 3%. And so these other traffic sources, it's, although we get most of our email subscribers to organic search, it may be interesting for us to double down on something like how do we, you know, get more direct traffic or referral traffic. Um, and that's, that's the kind of way to get to know, you know, which of your visitors are going to be most effective for you. And subscribing to an email list is just one metric. Your success metric may depend on what your business is. It may be a purchase. Uh, for us, the first step is getting an email subscriber. And so we have a little scroll box if you, like, went on to our... Yes, go ahead. Uh, Quick question. I wasn't sure if you were taking questions or you went all the way. Sure. So I hadn't decided, so. About conversions in the email um, or purchase, are you having to put something into Google for it to pick that up in the analytics? Or is it just that they're just getting more visitors from the website? Like, what's the process for that? Or is it just that they're getting more visitors? Uh, I don't know if I completely understand the question. It's, so is how it how to. How do you do it? Uh, to set up that event for that, oh, for, for that event, so to see that data, you mean? Uh -huh. yeah. uh, yes, you have to set that up specifically. It's just uh, an event uh, or a goal in, okay. in Google Analytics, so you can set that up. Um, was that the question? Do you have another question? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, so like that's totally right. As you guys could see, organic search traffic, a lot of those subscribers or a lot of those visitors didn't convert into email immediately. I'm a firm believer that being found in Google adds a lot to your brand, and that data is people coming to us from Google for the first time. And we get a significant amount of repeat visitors because once people have come to us once, I think it actually boosts the... Uh, the conversion rate of a lot of the other conversions there. So like a lot of that direct traffic, how does a lot of that get to us? I can't say for sure, but I'm sure a, some of those people came to us and found us on organic search first, as does the referral traffic, as does a lot of that other traffic. Um, but you're absolutely right. That's exactly why we want to look at this data, so we can see like who are our most effective people coming to our site in terms of what makes us our site successful. Um, yeah, very good question. And yeah, feel free to raise your hand if anybody else has questions. Um, we talked about organic traffic. So my thought is I want, to, I want my organic traffic, directly, uh, traffic coming directly from Google to be more effective at joining my email list. So we have a little scroll box that comes up on the left side. And this is specifically for people who come from Google. It doesn't show up for anybody else, only people who've come from Google. And it says never Google for WordPress help again, because that's literally what they did, right? They searched for, they didn't know how to do something, they searched Google, and this, you know, has improved conversion rate just in terms of people who have come directly from Google. Um, and I would not have known that without having the data of where my website visitors are coming from. Uh, A-B testing. I want to go over this quickly. A-B testing is not, you don't get like very specific data about your visitors, but you do get a good uh, idea of kind of how they behave. Um, a caveat, again, before I talk about A-B testing is if you don't have a significant amount of traffic, A-B testing is probably not what you want to focus on right now. Um, I know that's kind of a wishy-washy, like, what is the significant amount of traffic? Uh, if I, it were me, unless I had 5,000 visits a month or so, I probably wouldn't dive into A-B testing that much. I would probably focus on how to get more traffic and more targeted traffic. And then once you have a little bit more traffic, you can have a statistically significant amount of traffic to be able to, that your A-B tests make sense. So, um, but it's still very important, and I do want to go over it quickly. So A-B test uh, we ran. Uh, this is just a um, 
uh, exit intent pop up. So if someone was going to exit the site, this would come up uh, and it would just ask this question. And this drives people to our free ebooks page. And you can see the conversion rate at the top 5.36% of people click this. Pretty straightforward. We did an A-B test. You can see the difference between the buttons. There's no difference. The only difference is it's a smaller button. We just made the button smaller. I, did, I, did, I don't even remember why I did this exactly. I was just like, ah, I want to try this. Why not? The conversion rate, it's almost twice as much. It's like 1.6% higher. You know, We have a 60% increase in traffic um, that's being sent here. And it's all because it's a smaller button. And so A-B testing is really important because you have no idea what's going to convert well. Uh, I would think a smaller button is like less real estate, less clicks, but it's actually not true. A smaller button makes people maybe feel less intimidated by the button. I don't know. That's my assumption. But uh, you can see a higher conversion rate. And then we tried another A-B test, and we just kind of switched the whole question around. Your WordPress website is 100% secure and loads in less than and one second, right? Whoa, look at the conversion rate. It's like way higher. That's crazy. So yeah, it's a win, right? I mean, that's cool. Uh, and so it's important to try different things. And honestly, to like a lot of these tools, the free version doesn't have A-B testing. But if you're serious about A-B testing, pay the $25 a month or whatever to be able to do this, because it pays for itself literally immediately. What was that $25 a month for? Uh, it was for this tool, which gives you an email uh, opt-in form. This one is Sumo. This is what we use. Okay. Opt-in Monster is another option. There are a lot of uh, options out there. Yeah. Very good question. The, so conversion rate here is the click of the button. So if we're sending people to a free ebooks page, uh, so like this conversion rate, eight percent of people click this button. This twenty-five percent of people click this button. Good question. Thanks, Brad. Second water break. <laughs> Thanks for laughing. Sometimes I don't get laughs. It's a little awkward. <laughs> They're like, ha <laughs> ha, great. So, that was a good crab. Um, so, I don't always talk about tools because we just kind of heard in the keynote, I'd much rather talk about strategies than tools. There are a lot of tools out there that can do a lot of stuff. Uh, that being said, um, from personal experience, this is the best tool I've found for slightly more difficult wins. So, we kind of talked about Google Analytics. That's a really easy way to just get data, make changes based on that data. This takes a little more time and a little more effort, but uh, can get you a little bit more, uh, even more in-depth information about individual people visiting your site. Hotjar.com, you can go check it out. Um, you Google Hotjar, you'll find it. So one thing I really like about Hotjar, they have a lot of tools within Hotjar, but one is just a heat map you can use. So you can set a heat map to run for a week or a month or six months, whatever the time period you want. And you can see kind of where the hottest pieces of your website are in terms of clicks. You can also see mouse activity, but I always want to look at the clicks. I want to see where people are clicking. So it's interesting to see kind of what menu items are going to be your most popular ones. Um, so one thing we had here in like w under what we do services, we had uh, security, uh, performance, uh, and updates here. And I found that the performance was getting twice as many clicks, but it was below security. So I just moved it up. And I checked analytics later, and that page had 20% you know, more traffic or so. Um, so that's a really easy win, uh, just to see from heat map. Um, another thing that I really like about heat maps is it's kind of count counterintuitive, but it's not always what people are clicking on. That's important, but it's what people are not clicking on. So if I see buttons on my website that no one's clicking, I'll just I'll either change the button text, because maybe the button text isn't right, or I'll just remove that button entirely if it's not adding value to people. And this is proof that that's not adding value to people, right? No one's clicking it. And you can see that. Um, and I also find that it's, it's funny what people click. A lot of people click things that they think are clickable, and they're not on your website. And sometimes it's nice to just, maybe you want to make that clickable. Click Clickable. Maybe you want to make that clickable. Yeah, do you have a question? Yeah, I use mouse flow. Do you use, have you yeah. compared that with this and find it more beneficial to use Hotjar? 
I have absolutely not done that. Okay. And I don't have anything bad to say about mouse click. It could be an awesome tool, too. This is totally what I've used, and it's worked for me. Okay. Mouse flow is another option. Uh, check out both tools, you know? Um, and maybe you can tell us after I kind of go through some more hot jar, maybe some more stuff mouse flow does or doesn't have. Um, another piece uh, about hot jar that I really like is the uh, is this uh, funnel tracker here. So I can see kind of how many people uh, are converting on our website like into being a new customer, which is, is super interesting because you can see where huge drop offs are and you can uh, you can see you can see where the drop offs are and then you can make some you know guesses based on this data what's going on there and then you can use the hot the, the uh, heat mapping on your conversion pages to see where people are clicking and then get more information about you know the kind of people who are the 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 people on your website uh, and exactly what they're doing there and you can also use what's next which is uh, I don't have a video recording here but you can uh, hotjar does uh, screen recordings with non-personally non-personally identifiable information yeah period and so I always like to make this point because um, in the modern age of making sure people's data is private and their own uh, Hotjar is able to do screen recordings but it doesn't connect it with any individual or any person or any IP address or anything like that um, but you can this is a super awesome way to see exactly what people are doing on your website. Because the heat map's nice, you can see where people are clicking, but with, these, with this tool, you can, it's almost like you know, looking over someone's shoulder and seeing exactly how they're going through your website. Uh, what they like, what they don't like, what they click on, what they don't click on. Um, and you're seeing kind of individual experiences, um, which I think is, is super important. Um, it's important to remember that every single visitor to your website is just a person behind a computer navigating. Uh, and this really brings that to light. Um, so I could get lost in this like all day. I'll like be half an hour later and I'm like, why am I still watching this? Because I'm just watching videos because it's super, super uh, enlightening. I think this is the last Hotjar slide. Um, another thing I really like about Hotjar slides is, uh, is the ability to give polls to your uh, visitors. So. This is a like, super direct way to ask your visitors to interact with you and to let them self-select or answer questions for you so you can get to know them. I mean, this is one of the best ways to get to know the people who are visiting your website. Uh, and so what we did is we added a little poll. It's just a little kind of scroll box that comes up and asks a question. And you can make a multiple choice or like a long answer question. But we just asked people. Uh, we had it come up on our email subscription page. So someone subscribes for email, they get forwarded to a new page and says, thanks for subscribing, you're awesome, you rock. And then we had a little box that came up that asked this question. It said, what site are you working on? And the answers are my own website, client website, or both. And so you can see, you know, over half of the people are working on either a client site or a client site on their own site. So a lot of people who are coming to our site were developers, were freelancers, were people working with clients. And so this kind of changed the trajectory of our business pretty radically. You know, we started working with agencies, we started working with freelancers, and now 65 or 70 percent of the, the websites we manage are through agencies, or through freelancers, or through WordPress hosts. Um, and so one small question we asked people made a huge difference in our business which I think is pretty amazing. Uh, so we, we kind of talked about a few ways to get to know the people who are coming to your website specifically, which is super important, obviously. But I also want, it, I want to get across the idea that there are also there's this whole audience for you out there on the web. Uh, and it's not just the people who are coming to your website, but it's just your entire kind of potential audience out there. Uh, and so a tool I really like to use is BuzzSumo. Um, if you go to the site, they'll try to like upsell you really hard on BuzzSumo Pro, which is kind of annoying. But you, do, you can search for uh, terms in your industry and kind of see what are the most popular and most shared content on the web uh, over the past year or so. And I just think it's really interesting to see like what kind of content is resonating in 
my industry. Um, I had to blur this one piece out, 11 amazing ways to, but I can't complete it because that was an inappropriate, somewhat inappropriate, uh, <laughs> inappropriate uh, blog post. <laughs> but the others are super interesting. I know I especially like this last one, you know, the definitive PHP, uh, you know, uh, HHVM benchmark, which I won't get into the technical aspects of that, but it's kind of interesting that was one of the most popular pieces of content out there. If a lot of developers are sharing that uh, and engaging with that kind of content online, maybe I want to write more content about PHP. Maybe that would help me to draw more people who are going to be, you know, a good audience members for me. This? Yeah. Buzz Sumo. Buzz like a bee, Sumo like the wrestler. And it's kind of confusing because I, this is Buzz Sumo and the tool I talked about before was Sumo. They're different, but both have sumo in them. <laughs> I guess I like the sumo wrestling. Uh, all right, kind of last piece uh, of information here. Um, I think it, it's actually kind of sad that I only have one slide here because we talked so much about kind of these easy wins and easier ways to do things. I kind of have here this unscalable, time-consuming, frustrating, and possibly the most important ways to get to know folks. Um, because a lot of these ways aren't scalable. They won't, you, you, no one has unlimited bandwidth. You only have 24 hours a day and, you know, it's time consuming. It takes a lot of time. Sometimes it's frustrating because it's just, you're dealing with people and people a lot of times can be frustrating. Um, but these kind of one-on-one -on -one experiences really allow you to get to know the people who are engaging with you the most. Um, and so these are just a few of what I've used that have been really successful in helping us to grow our business. And not just grow the business, but build a service that people need in a way that they need it. And that's, I think, what we're trying to do, whether you're building a product or selling a product or a service or whatever you're doing with your website, this is how we really start engaging people. Um, Facebook groups are really great for WordPress. There are a bunch of really good ones out there. Um, when I say Facebook group, I guess that's specific to Facebook, but online forums, I guess, is what I was trying to get across. Um, at the end of the day, you kind of just want to like hang out where your audience hangs out. And that's what I do. And I comment, and I post, and I try to add value there. Um, and just being part of that community in the long term really helps you to, to learn about the other people and what kind of language they're using and what their pain points are. This is one of the best ways to do that. <sighs> Sending personal emails, not super scalable because I just can't hang out sending emails all day, but there, are, especially when you're starting out and you don't know your audience that well, sending a personal email to someone and starting a dialogue may be the best way to get to know them, right? Maybe they want to hop on a quick call with you. Maybe they want to do uh, like a video call. Um, maybe you just send a single question to them, you know, what's your biggest pain point? And I always thought like, no one's going to answer these emails. But I get a lot of answers, even in the automated emails I send that people join our email list and then ask them a question. A lot of get, we get a lot of replies to those because um, people do want to share some of that information. Meeting in person, um, you're already doing that, so congratulations, well done. Uh, WordCamps are a great place for WordPress specifically uh, to meet other people in the industry, but it, again, it's going to depend on your industry or what area you're in. Um, you want to, uh, to, to meet people in person. Um, because there is something about meeting in person that's different about than meeting online. Um, you, you get to read people's body language. You get to really, like, when someone has a pain point, you really feel that pain point, And it does make a difference, I think. Staying current, uh, this is just kind of whatever industry you're in, um, staying up to date on these things is important. And it kind of trickles down from the other part, being part of the Facebook groups. and going to the, you know, a conference or a meetup, um, but staying current uh, really helps you to, uh, to continue to get to know your industry and know what people are talking about. The last point here I have is be authentic and curious. Um, I think, you know, this talk is titled How to Get to Know Your Website Visitors, but it's a two-way street. You want your website visitors to get to know you, too. And if you're not being authentic, then what's the point? The point is to try to build your tribe. It's to try to build your group of people who like, think you're awesome regardless of how weird you are. Uh, and I think that's super important. 
just that authenticity because there are people out there who do what you do. So if you want to make jokes in your blog post, if that's your style, like, cool, go for it. If you're more serious, that's cool too. There's no right way to do it. The right way is your way to do things. No. Okay, question about that slide while you're fixing that. Yes. That's a good question. I don't know if I do. I think some of this data is just, it's in having the conversations with people. Uh, I guess like maybe if I'm having an in, like in-person conversation with someone, maybe I'll write down an idea afterwards. But a lot of it is just about affecting your thinking about how people in your, in your industry or in your area are thinking. Um, and I think over the long term, the deeper you can dive into that and the more you can interact and engage with that, the more, the easier it'll be for you to steer in the right direction in terms of whatever the kind of content you want to write, the kind of language you want to use on the website, I think it shapes it kind of slowly. Um, so that's a good question. Matt, for my next time I give this talk, I will put more thought into that and try and add something there. But that's a good, good thought. Um, yeah. Okay. Back to, I'm so sorry, back to no, no. Um, So it does heat maps, and it can tell what device someone's using. So the heat map, what it does with the heat map is it splits it into three different heat maps. It has desktop, uh, tablet width, and mobile width. So when you're on the heat map, you can choose just a little toggle at the top that says, I want to look at all the mobile visitors. And then it shrinks your screen and just shows where people are clicking on a mobile device. Okay. Same with tablet, same with desktop. So Hotjar is fully GDPR compliant and all that. Whenever someone, it was funny because I was thinking the same thing. Like, like I, I, people are typing their credit card information. Like, I, I can't. You, how is this tool like legal? Anything anybody types in is completely uh, obfuscated. Is that a word? So you can't see what anybody's typing in. Um, which is there's right there's fear. Like if someone's typing in their credit card information. Obviously, you don't want anybody with Hotjar access to have access to that. Uh, you also there's the thought that if someone types in their email address and then they decide not to opt in, like someone could just like take that and like throw it in their email list. Oh, you subscribed. Um, that'd be a jerk move. But it's it's all text that someone types. It's all text that someone types, and it's numbers. It, you can't see any numbers. So if I were to look up like if I were to look at a recording, um, and I have like 50 somewhere in the text on my screen, it'll just have stars there instead. It doesn't. I think it depends on the kind of private message you're talking about. If someone's typing in like a contact form that's embedded on your site, it's going to be obfuscated. If it's a live chat, I don't know actually if live chat obfuscated, but live chat's a third party tool, so I don't know how they play. Yeah, it's a good question. I always have concerns about this stuff, so uh, I totally am with you on all this. Um, yeah, check it out. Do some more research. I will too. Yes. What do you think about like the revoking of some of the sites and then <coughs> they're displaying them all year? Hmm. And how do they do that? And is it possible? <laughs> <laughs> so you go to someone's site. Did you put in a phone number or anything, or are they? You just somehow got a call. Mm. Yeah. I don't think I've ever had someone call me without giving them my information. That sounds sketchy. I would not work with a company like that. I <laughs> maybe some other people have. I'm a big believer, and everyone has the ability to do whatever they want to on their site. I'm a big believer in pe having people opt in two things as opposed to kind of forcing their hand on things. If someone wants to join our email list, that's fine. If they don't, that's also fine. Uh, yeah, that's good, a, that's a good thing. If you, wanna, if you wanna call, and if you wanna call, you can ask for a call. Yeah, that is creepy, I agree. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry about that. You had a question here, yeah, um, you're next. Sort of on the opposite end of that, some people are gonna say that Facebook, that's creepy. 
most all of our clients, that's what they're asking for. Yeah. They basically want some type of tool. Actually, that's why I thought I thought the talk was going to be about the talk was titled "Get to Know Behind the DAO Who's Visiting Your Website." It seems to be geared more towards demographics and who your target is audience, that type of thing. Do you know of software that's able to suck in information automatically from an IP address? Uh, is that Leadlander? I've sort of dabbled with it, but that is almost across the board. All of our clients want to know. Okay, all these people are coming to the website. Mm -hmm. We know that they're in between the ages of 30 and 35, 18 to male, yada, yada, yada. But that's sort of where it stops. Mm -hmm. Unless that user takes an action on the website. Yep. We use different recording software and we try and track some of that, but they're looking at, I need an email address and contact information. And, uh, and we'll reach out to you, hopefully in a non-creepy way. Mm -hmm. That's what they're asking from me. Yep. How they deal with that is sort of their, on their end. Can, do you know of any software? So I don't know of any software that does something like that. Uh, if I'm just speaking from personal experience, and I know you're talking about this is what your clients want, yep. if, I'm, if I'm in that position, I feel like there's a line there of, so a lot of this data I've shown uses general information to kind of give you, again, general data that's not personally identifiable for people to get an idea of what the individuals look like on your site, which I think is fine. I have no issue with that and I think is ethical. Yeah. I think that getting information about people in that way, especially in that like bulk way, for me is just like not something I would do. Like again, I want people to like opt in. Uh, and I, I, I think it's, it's more, it, it's more, it's better for me in the long term to continue testing to figure out how to get people to opt in than to just take their data without asking them permission for it. And so that's what I want to do. Um, I don't know any tools like that, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead, and then you're next. <laughs> I think that, so I talked about this a little bit in my like last slide, which is like how to like make sure you do this. Um, I keep it pretty simple and we just kind of have repeat tasks in our project management that says, you know, it's not that time of the month to look at analytics, to dig into it, and to try and take next actions. Um, in terms of actually doing those next actions, um, sometimes it's me, sometimes it's someone on our team, um, but we'll kind of put together kind of monthly action steps in terms of like looking at this data and seeing like what do we want to change, like what's our content look like for next month that's going to match some of this. Um, and also asking the question like is this what we want, like is this the traffic we want to get, I don't know. Uh, or is this the kind of audience we want to be building, do we need to pivot? Um, so maybe we can touch base after this and kind of talk about some like more stuff that I haven't, that I haven't just thought of off the top of my head. We can go into more depth. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Kind of piggybacking on the previous conversation, I do have similar clients who um, are responding to their own experiences. I was visiting the site, I was doing research, and within, say, 48 hours, <coughs> I received an email that isn't personalized. It's not, you know, dear John, we thought you were visiting our website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're there, and you're there. It's not the general demographic. Um, so regardless of whether there's a moral gray area there or not, there are people who are doing it as sort of a warm sales mm -hmm. type follow-up. And it's not like they're automatically asking for the email address. They're going to do that once. Hopefully.
Yeah. I think that there's, I think that there's a lot of, I think that there is, there's, people are trying to find more and more ways to figure out exactly who you are online so that they can sell things to you better and market things to you better. I don't think anybody in this room has a doubt about that. Um, I wanted to give a talk that talked about ways that don't get people's data without their permission, uh, but still giving you data to be able to be able to target some of those people better. So uh, this one was right. There, there is a gray area that I think that a lot of people in positions like mine who are doing marketing have to figure out. And some of the bi some businesses are not going to do that, uh, and some are. I don't know if I, I don't know if I have a better question or answer than that. Um, but that was what I was trying to focus on in this talk. Um, but did I answer your question? I don't. I kind of missed. Okay. Agreed. Agreed. Yes. Um, I was going to say, um, I agree with the empire. I think that that kind of falls a little bit under the whole GDPR stuff. And while we don't have it here, um, I think it's coming. So while people, they can do that now, I would say <coughs> it's so expensive now that in the future, if you're doing it, they're doing it, it's legal in a couple of years. Yeah. And GDPR, so we've fully complied with GDPR. We have customers uh, in Europe, but regardless of that, these are important things that companies need to do. Um, the one issue I find with GDPR is that it's pretty unenforceable. Um, the big companies like the GoDaddies of the world are going to be held to a very high standard and they will be fined millions of dollars if they don't follow it, but there are a lot of smaller companies out there that, I mean, it's going to take tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to enforce it across all these sites. They don't have that resources, so I don't know how much it's going to help. But I do agree with the, the concept behind GDPR. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't include buyer personas in here. Um, buyer personas are cool. I do like using them. Um, so buyer persona is just you, from some of this data, you kind of create a fictional person that's like, this is this kind of buyer. Uh, and it <coughs> kind of creates a real person that you're trying to you know, convert into a uh, sale. Uh, I find some issues with buyer personas because I think there are, <laughs> there are yeah, the stereotypes happen not Consciously, a lot of the time, just subconsciously, just like. So, I I don't always use buyer personas, and I don't rely on them that heavily because um, I think there are some biases that come in some of that stuff. So. Um, yeah, go ahead. We'll keep going with questions. We'll come back to you. Sorry, I missed you, but. Uh, what tool were you using? What method were you using to uh, connect the dots between this team from Google Search? Would you say the Sumo, or would you use the Google Analytics? Uh, Google Analytics tells me referral traffic, or excuse me, it no. tells me where traffic came from. You know, I'm talking about specifically changing the pop-up. Yeah, that so that was through Sumo. Have you been able to connect the dots to what term they were searching? Because I'm sure that I've seen analytics, right? E, so, yes and no. The, you can see how people, so I can see I can look, rank the content on my website and see what kind of content is getting the most traffic through organic search. And thus I can tell kind of the, con the kind of content people were searching for. Um, I also track where we're like ranking search engines so I can see like what kind of terms we're ranking for. Um, Google does kind of take away some of that data. So what's the pop-up and stuff? I'm not going to be able to customize like because you search this, this search term is now on the pop-up. Not that I know of. Yeah. I just know the Google part. That's a good, I, I like that idea, it's cool. You were searching for this. I tried to kind of blanket it and say, never Google for help again, because that's like, everyone who Googled was like searching for some, some sort of WordPress help or help with WordPress. Um, sorry, he had a question. I want to make sure I got to answer it here. Um, I, I don't want to dwell on the conversation too long, but <laughs> going back to the whole, you know, identifying users on your website, yeah. 
whether or not it's more of a gray area, I think on a very basic level, people are creeped out by that. You know, they don't give you their information. Whether or not you can respond to them, I just don't think that they like it. But I think there are other ways you can touch base with those individuals without knowing who they are. So basic things like remarketing ads and things like that. You can get your name in front of them again and inspire some kind of conversion without you know, illegally pulling their information. I totally agree. I, tr I tried to mention this before, and I want to try and make the point again, because I don't know if I did it super well. I think it's much more, it's much more efficient for my business in the long term to find positive ways to interact with people and to maybe not have some of those quick wins that some of those tools give you. Like, here's all the data. Like, go yeah. get it. Maybe it'll be good for a short-term burst. Like, maybe it's good for this month. But I'm focused on like building an audience like in the next year, in the next five years, and I want to be a brand that people love, and that's how I do it personally. I think that. I think that's the way to go, but and I agree with what you said. Yes? Um, if you are looking for a type of software, you can go to G2 Corral, and they'll tell you how to create ones. And uh, G2 it's active campaign is the most affordable one, and it's like 250 bucks a month. Yep. Part of another one, right? Plus five and nine hours. Yeah, these are all kind of CRM-y, uh, yeah. sales CRM sort of things. Yeah. Yeah, we use ConvertKit. But yeah. it's very useful for a lot of other reasons other than just trying to call people and you can uh, find all sorts of yeah. like, different returning visits of people who have already opted in and how many times they uh, were yeah. chosen before converting into the sale. And to me, that's like, I think HubSpot, like the reason I would like something like a HubSpot is like, you can see like what ebooks people downloaded. Like they downloaded these three of your 10 ebooks. So you can say like, you like this content, like here's some more content that's similar to this. And in that concept, and you're and providing it's not, better customer service when you speak with them. And it's not taking any personally identifiable information. Yeah, click data is a little different, I think. So. Yes? I was just wondering, this off topic, but what's your bounce rate? And do you separate out you know, regular pages from blog post pages? I don't know exactly what my bounce rate is. And uh, you know when you're looking, like we I have a, um, we I've been blogging for nine years, and so mm -hmm. my bounce rate I think is higher. Mm -hmm. I know it's higher. I haven't ever separated my blog pages out from my regular web design agency pages to to see the difference. I just didn't know if you knew because it's higher if people are searching on your stuff and they come and they find what they need and then they go to apply it, and so they're leaving. Correct. So bounce rate's a funny thing because. You want a lower bounce rate because you want people doing more on your website. But you also kind of want a higher bounce rate because you want people to like get the value from the blog post you wrote, right? Like high bounce rate on a blog post. Our, I think our, our bounce rate on most blog posts is probably like 80% or like 70%. It's pretty high because, I mean, that's the point of the blog post. Like I'm, we're trying to provide answers. And again, it's kind of that opt-in thing. Like, I don't want to like put crazy stuff in front of people. Being like, you have to like become an email subscriber. I give them an opportunity to, but I don't. I try not to go into overkill, right? So people have the opportunity to opt in if they want to, and I think that I think that makes a huge difference in terms of like the engagement to our email list because they weren't kind of like forced to, right? It's like people who want to be there, like this talk. Like you guys want to be here, so this is cool. Right? Sorry, I you force anyone in here? Yeah, I force you guys in here. You guys don't know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Right. It's, 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 it's <laughs> that Google Tag Manager is going to be able to track more specific uh, events and what that individual person is doing. Uh, Google Tag, the question is like moving Google Analytics to Google Tag Manager. Um, I don't know if Google Tag Manager super well. We just brought in some conversion people to help us with this, and they moved us over to Google Tag Manager. Because apparently, it's very good. Uh, I don't want to comment because I just don't really. Does it need more individual information? Yes, I've not dived into Tag Manager, but I, I know. I'm just trying to get my feet wet into it. Yeah, well, people so. are starting to move in that direction. It is very powerful. So Google Tag Manager is something you may want to look into. Google Analytics first. But then you may want to check out Google Tag Manager because there is some additional data. And I, I will say that Google Tag Manager, it and Analytics work together. So yeah. you're not off of Analytics when you right. use it. You're really just supplementing the information you already get. They do read all your data on Google Tag Manager. But the other thing is Google does offer a lot of support help. So if you don't know how to use Google Tag Manager, sometimes there's some development involved to be able to track specific actions. Yeah. They'll often have offer help to do it for you. Uh, I will say sometimes they'll keep you on the phone for an hour or two to do it, but we'll do it. So. Yep. In the back. Uh, one opportunity with Google Tag Manager is uh, enhanced cross-domain tracking. So yeah. you can see how people are navigating between multiple domains as opposed to one. Yeah. Yeah. 
the app like that. If you have multiple sites, yeah. you can, it's at like one plus one equals three kind of thing. You can really like see how people are interacting between multiple sites, and that's super powerful. So I agree. I just, we just have our second site now, so now we will start using that. Um, I'm going to go through my last two slides super quick, and we kind of have questions and answers already. Um, kind of talk a little bit about like how I do it. I feel like a lot of people are working on a ton of stuff uh, on their website. I think to make it super easy. Input like five times and see if it comes back. Did that do anything? No. No? Still no? There it is. There it is. I just turned it back on. Have you tried turning it off and back on again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, right. <laughs> um, so I, I'm a pretty firm believer in like in sleep methodology. Um, so, I turn these things on, I, I set review tasks for myself to check, um, and depending on where your traffic numbers are, you may want to check daily if you have a lot of traffic, you may want to check weekly, you may want to check monthly. Um, the, you measure some of those results uh, and make adjustments, uh, and then you let it run for another cycle. Um, and we kind of mentioned kind of like next steps I take. A lot of this is about experimentation. I just want to make that super clear. Um, I don't. I have some tools and stuff for you, but at the end of the day, you're going to be successful if you're experimenting with this. And I think this is the best way to do it. Um, it takes a lot of times through this cycle, um, but each time you get a little bit better or a little bit worse. But even when you get worse, you figure out what you need to do to get better. And so uh, this is kind of the uh, strategy I follow. Uh, that's worked for us pretty well. Final thoughts. There's no finish line. I kind of talked about that, so I won't dwell on it. Uh, we'll always have complainers. Um, what you said was totally not complaining and it was absolutely spot on. But we get some people who do complain about like our little pop-ups that come up. Oh, why is this pop-up coming out? Like, you know, every once in a while live chat, someone comes in and it's like, you guys suck. <laughs> it's going to happen. If most of your people, visitors are saying that, maybe you have to finish it. But you'll always have a few people who are complainers. That's it. Uh, is traffic going to get the traffic I want? Uh, are the people who are coming to your website the people who want to come to your website? Um, that's, that, that's an important question to ask um, because you can see all this data, you can cater your website to them, but at the end of the day, is that really going to help? Uh, last question is how am I going to budget for these tools? Uh, how am I going to dedicate time to this? Uh, I talked a little bit about that lean methodology already, but um, I. I kiss. I keep it simple, stupid. Because for me, if it's complicated, it's not happening. If it's simple and it's executable, I'll do it. So I just, again, keep it simple. I just set repeating tasks for myself. Uh, I look at all this stuff once a month. So I have it set up on my calendar to turn my phone on airplane mode. I have a cup of tea. I, I don't have live chat on our websites. I'm not chatting to people. I just specifically focus on this stuff. And that's what works for me. Um, just have to dedicate that time to it. Um, I think a lot of people say that, but it's just the, that's it. Uh, oh, okay, we're done. I'm Joe, WP Buffs, WPMRR. Check us out at Any Hackers, and the slides are available for y'all whenever you want it. Uh, so thank you very much. around all day if you have any other questions come up and talk to me and say hi and I'm gonna hang out right here at least for like a couple of minutes but I want to make sure the other speaker oh we've got 20 minutes so yeah I'll be hanging around <laughs>